On the 25th of February, 1984, a dreadful event occurred that shook the life of 19-year-old Donna D. McHale. Her existence was heartlessly snuffed out, and her remains were inconsiderately discarded in a shallow grave. The mystery surrounding this monstrous act was veiled in obscurity for almost 40 years, until another woman fell into the crosshairs of the same perpetrator. Why did it take nearly four decades to unravel this mystery? And what was the crucial evidence that finally broke the case wide open? In today's episode, we're going to explore the perplexing case of Donna D. Macheo, a chilling cold case from 1984 that remained unsolved for nearly 40 long years. Before we dive in, if you haven't yet subscribed to our channel, please remember to like, subscribe, and hit the bell icon below. Your support motivates us to continue creating captivating content for our audience. So without further preamble, let's unravel this mystery. East Windsor, a township located in Mercer County, New Jersey, is known for its suburban charm and its proximity to major cities like Trenton and Princeton. A blend of residential areas, commercial centers, and natural landscapes characterizes East Windsor. The township boasts various parks, recreational facilities, and cultural attractions, providing residents and visitors numerous opportunities for outdoor activities and community engagement. But beneath the surface of this seemingly idyllic setting, a horrifying crime was about to unfold. Donna D. Macho's journey began on October 16, 1964, in East Windsor. She was the cherished daughter of Betty Lou Thompson Macchio and Ronald Wayne Macheo. As time passed, Donna's family grew with the arrival of her younger sister, Julie Macheo, in 1969. Their mother, Betty, found love again and married a man named Garland, leading to the formation of a blended family that Donna and Julie warmly welcomed. Donna Macheo was a vivacious young woman who radiated passion for cooking and sewing. She worked as a legal secretary, but also nurtured dreams of pursuing a career in modeling. To her sister Julie, Donna was a beacon of inspiration. Despite life's various challenges, Donna's spirit remained undimmed as she continued to embrace life's offerings. Little did she know, her journey would take a sudden, tragic detour, leaving a lasting impact on those who held her dear. On February 25, 1984, 14-year-old Julie Macho was spending a typical Saturday night at their family home in East Windsor. Upon noticing her sister Donna's car parked outside, she decided to join her in the basement. They enjoyed a night of watching eerie movies, wrapping up around 2 a.m. At that point, Julie retired to her room upstairs, while their mother, Betty, and stepfather, Garland, were already asleep. They remained unaware of any unusual noises or disturbances from the basement. The following day, Donna was scheduled to be at work at a law firm. Her absence throughout the day did not initially cause any concern. However, as dinner time approached and Donna still had not returned home, unease began to set in, worried for her daughter's safety. Betty decided to investigate by checking Donna's basement apartment. Upon stepping into Donna's typically orderly apartment, Betty was immediately struck by the unusual chaos. It was clear that a struggle had occurred within this space. The sign of bloodied clothes haphazardly piled together amplified Betty's growing apprehension, leading her to swiftly alert the police. When the officers arrived, they embarked on a thorough examination of the entire basement, their sharp eyes seeking any shred of evidence that could help solve this mystery. Their hard work bore fruit when they found barely visible fingerprints near a table adjacent to the bed. Recognizing the potential importance of this discovery, they meticulously collected the prints alongside the bloody clothes. Additionally, traces of bodily fluids found in the bedroom serve as a crucial lead that promised to bring them a step closer to identifying the perpetrator and locating Donna. In their quest for answers, the investigators made a dismal discovery in March 1984. Donna Macheo's abandoned, blood-soaped car near a sewage plant approximately a mile from her home. Despite this clue, the enigma surrounding her disappearance persisted. The investigators left no stone unturned 
sifting through innumerable records and painstakingly interviewing local residents, all with the hope of unearthing a lead that could guide them to the truth. In a twist of fate, the investigation veered in a new direction when they began suspecting several individuals, including Nathaniel Harvey, a former farmhand from East Windsor. Harvey, previously arrested for his alleged involvement in a series of assaults and a horrifying murder in the Plainsboro region, did not provide any breakthroughs in the case at that time. A critical piece of evidence, the bodily fluid found in Donna's bedroom, was sent for testing. Unfortunately, the DNA testing technology of that era lacked the sophistication required to accurately pinpoint the source of the sample. However, the investigators remained hopeful that future advancements could provide them with the solid leads needed to solve Donna's case. The profound sorrow of Donna's disappearance eventually overwhelmed her stepfather, who tragically passed away merely six months after her disappearance, leaving the family to navigate their grief in solitude. In their tireless pursuit to find the killer, the family hired private investigators, trackers, and even consulted psychics. They exhausted their resources in this endeavor, their unwavering hope fueling their belief that Donna might still be alive. In 1987, seeking a fresh start and some semblance of peace, Julie and her mother made the heart-wrenching decision to relocate to Texas. However, their journey towards healing was further interrupted by a cruel twist of fate when their storage unit was burglarized, resulting in the loss of irreplaceable family photos, treasured keepsakes, and 16 boxes of investigation files. For 11 long years, there was no news. Then, on April 2, 1995, the police received a call from a Boy Scout troop reporting a body found near Cranberry. The body, in a severe state of decay, was unrecognizable. But when the dental records were matched, the investigators found the key piece of the puzzle that they had been tirelessly searching for over the past decade. In a secluded woodland near a cranberry farm, the lifeless body of Donna Di Macheo was discovered, shrouded within a carpet, not far from where her abandoned vehicle was found. After a thorough autopsy, initial analysis suggested that Donna had tragically succumbed to a gunshot wound to her head. As the investigation evolved, the committed professionals at the Middle Assault Regional Medical Examiner's Office conducted an in-depth examination of her remains. Their meticulous investigation revealed that her fatal injury was indeed to the head, though it couldn't be unequivocally identified as a gunshot wound. Consequently, the cause of death was revised to indicate evidence of homicidal violence, retaining its classification as a homicide. Despite this pivotal lead, the inquiry struggled to produce definitive results, gradually stagnating until the case was ultimately lost in the oblivion of unresolved mysteries. In February 2022, a renewed sense of purpose came in the form of Mercer County Prosecutor Angelo Onofre, who ordered the revival of the Donna Macheo case. The investigation was transferred to the Office of Public Integrity and Accountability's Central Regional Cold Case Task Force an assiduous team within the statewide cold case network, established by the New Jersey Attorney General in 2019. As a key step in the revitalized investigation, all pertinent physical evidence, including DNA samples, were meticulously resubmitted to the state police's Central Regional Laboratory. This move was designed to harness cutting-edge forensic techniques and technology in the relentless pursuit of truth and justice. Modern DNA technology was instrumental in illuminating new aspects of the case. The bodily fluid evidence, recovered from Donna Macchio's bedroom, was meticulously reanalyzed, leading to a conclusive match with the DNA profile of Nathaniel Harvey. Remarkably, Harvey's DNA was the sole genetic material discovered in the room that wasn't supposed to be present, according to the Attorney General's office. This breakthrough brought much-needed clarity and resolution to the enduring enigma. Born in 1942 in East Windsor, Nathaniel Harvey was no stranger to controversy and trouble. His proclivity for mischief landed him behind bars for a significant part of his life. Despite tying the knot in 1968, details about his wife remain shrouded in mystery. A resident of East Windsor, Harvey had a litany of crimes attributed to his name. To the West Windsor Police, 
he was known as a bold intruder with a conviction for assault. He had a modus operandi of surreptitiously breaking into unsecured homes, abducting young women, and perpetrating violent acts. His notorious activities had always kept him on the radar of authorities, making him a person of interest in their quest for justice. During the 1984 to 1985 period, local authorities were on high alert as a wave of burglaries unsettled Plainsboro, West Windsor, and neighboring areas. Among their concerns were the unresolved murder of East Windsor resident Irene Schnapps and the baffling disappearance of Donna Michal from her family's East Windsor home. Tragedy struck East Windsor once more, 16 months after Donna Michal's disappearance, when Irene Schnapps, a 37-year-old widow, was tragically murdered overnight on Saturday, June 15, 1985, or in the early morning hours of the next day. Alarmed by her absence from work, one of Irene's RCA Americum colleagues visited her apartment on Research Way on the morning of June 16, 1985. The devastating scene he stumbled upon led him to alert the police, who arrived to be greeted by a deeply distressing sight. Irene Schnapps fell victim to a brutal assault, suffering more than 15 severe blows to her head, likely from an axe or hatchet. Her bedroom bore the distressing remnants of the atrocity, with her lifeless form lying exposed on the blood-drenched floor. Amidst this harrowing tableau, investigators identified a significant lead, a bloodied footprint imprinted on a pillowcase, capable of potentially unraveling the mystery behind Irene's unfortunate end. Peter Stauser, a 41-year-old gentleman, emerged to share his narrative with the detectives. Known to be a congenial acquaintance of Irene, he disclosed that he might be the last person to have seen her alive. However, after revealing his ties to Irene, his life took an unforeseen turn. The police began to make regular visits to his residence, and on June 17, 1985, he found himself at the Middle Assault Prosecutor's Office under a rigorous line of questioning regarding Irene's tragic demise. Stoasser confessed his growing emotional attachment towards Irene and his hopeful aspirations for a potential romantic bond. Yet, Irene, still mourning her husband's loss, requested time and space before committing to any new relationships. As Stowasser patiently awaited the opportune moment to express his feelings, he continued to foster a friendly rapport with Irene, inviting her to social gatherings to assure her she was not alone. However, the prospect of their relationship was abruptly extinguished when Irene's life was tragically cut short, casting a shadow of suspicion over Stowasser. Law enforcement procured a search warrant for Stowasser's residence. During the search, they found a quilt with suspicious stains, possibly blood-related. They also confiscated a pair of white work gloves and a metal strip with reddish blotches from his car. Forensic analysis of the quilt revealed traces of human blood and hairs that appeared to correspond with Irene's. Stowasser insisted that the stains on the quilt were from menstrual blood of another woman he was romantically involved with. As the inquiry advanced, Stowasser was subjected to a polygraph test, which he failed. However, the results of such tests were not legally admissible. It also surfaced that he had previously served jail time for stalking an ex-girlfriend. Nonetheless, the police eventually dismissed Stowasser as the primary suspect, primarily due to a substantial discrepancy in shoe sizes. While Stowasser wore size 12 shoes, the bloody footprint at the crime scene indicated a size 6 shoe. This unexpected variation in foot size redirected the investigation elsewhere. Then, on October 28, 1985, a pivotal breakthrough occurred. That day, Nathaniel Harvey launched a spree of terror in the southern region of West Windsor, culminating in a significant shift in the investigation. The initial call to the dispatch center reported a distressing incident in Dutch Neck Estates. A 13-year-old girl narrowly escaped a kidnapping attempt from her own home. However, her courage prevailed as she managed to free herself and alert her parents with a piercing scream. The assailant, taken aback by the commotion, fled the scene. Subsequently, this man invaded another residence, likely to elude the police. He 
he was confronted by the homeowner who, upon turning on the light, found Nathaniel Harvey threatening him with an axe. Sensing imminent danger, Harvey quickly pivoted, broke the glass door with a forceful swing of the axe, and disappeared into the woods. With his unsettling predilection for axes, Harvey had established a disconcerting pattern of employing these formidable weapons to terrorize his victims. In one of his criminal acts, he falsely claimed to, to wield an axe while he was truly armed with a knife, intensifying the climate of fear. The insightful law enforcement officers did not overlook the chilling similarity between his claim and the murder weapon, believed to be an axe, used in Irene Schnapp's killing. This eerie link added depth to Harvey's criminal pattern. Soon after, the investigators meticulously calmed through the area, spotting Harvey crossing a soybean field before he disappeared into the woods. Swiftly, the police converged on his location near the Princeton Arms Shopping Center. It was at the intersection of Old Trenton Road and Dorchester Drive that a state trooper apprehended Harvey. Upon interrogation, the police uncovered the magnitude of Harvey's solitary crime rampage. He admitted to a series of burglaries that had sent shockwaves through the community. His confessions, however, unveiled an even more horrific side of his depravity, revealing an assault he had recently committed. Before Irene's tragic death, Harvey had kidnapped a young girl from East Windsor, forcibly taking her to an abandoned building on Dutch Neck Road. The victim, identified as Donna Michal, was innocently enjoying a cigarette on her deck when Harvey abruptly seized her. Following Harvey's arrest, the 13-year-old girl was asked to confirm if Harvey was indeed the man who had attacked her on October 28, 1985. Her brave testimony identified Harvey as her attacker. Authorities, considering the brutal and perverse nature of the attack, made a tough decision to refrain from pressing charges, fearing the potential traumatic impact on the victim. Yet, the case saw a significant breakthrough when investigators obtained a search warrant and performed an exhaustive search of Harvey's car in November 1985. The car was parked in the Princeton Arms apartment complex. Inside, they discovered compelling evidence directly tying him to the Irene Schnapps murder. Among the stolen items from various recent burglaries, a significant discovery was a Seiko watch. The watch was positively identified as Irene's, stolen from her apartment at the time of the murder, solidifying the connection between Harvey and the crime. Interestingly, it turned out that Harvey's wife lived in the same apartment complex as Irene. This detail, however, had to remain confidential due to his wife's dependence on state aid. Furthermore, authorities claimed that Harvey initially confessed to Irene's murder. During his interrogation at the West Windsor Police Headquarters, Harvey, confronted with several issues, asked to speak with his father. His father's advice prompted him to confess to the murder of Irene Schnapps. Following Harvey's arrest, a quilt confiscated from Stowasser, Irene's neighbor, who was also a person of interest in the murder, was returned. A glove and metal strip, taken from his car, underwent testing but showed no presence of blood. In 1986, Harvey was convicted for Irene Schnapp's murder. However, the state Supreme Court overturned his conviction in 1990, stating that his confession had been obtained without properly informing him of his Miranda rights. Harvey immediately retracted his confession, arguing it was coerced. This development sparked debate over the validity of his initial confession and whether he should have been reminded of his Miranda rights after speaking with his father. Conflicting accounts emerged concerning Harvey's confession. Avid Kleiner, Harvey's attorney, denied that Harvey confessed to the murder of Irene, contradicting the police's claim that he had admitted to the crime, albeit the confession was not recorded. The court overturned the initial conviction based on their ruling that Harvey should have been reminded of his Miranda rights after requesting to speak to his father. In 1994, during the second trial, the focus shifted to crucial blood evidence found at the crime scene. The prosecution presented DNA evidence showing genetic traits matching both Harvey's blood sample and the stains found on a box spring in Irene Schnapp's apartment. Despite the nascent stage of DNA testing, 
it indicated that Harvey could not be excluded as a contributor. To fortify their case, prosecution experts utilized dot intensity analysis, a method that estimated the consistency between the blood characteristics found at the scene and Harvey's DNA. They concluded that such a match would be expected in only one out of every 1,400 African-American individuals. The defense experts challenged this, suggesting the ratio could be as low as 1 in 50. This time, Harvey's conviction held, and he received the death sentence. The state Supreme Court upheld this verdict in 1997, albeit some justices expressed differing views. Justice Allen B. Handler, in his dissenting opinion, scrutinized the 64-page analysis of the DNA testing presented in the case. He voiced his doubts and predicted that the decision would likely be reversed by a state or federal court in the future. In an unexpected twist, Avid Kleiner, Harvey's attorney, accused Peter Stosser, a former neighbor of Irene, of involvement in the case. Despite Stosser having once been considered a potential suspect, he was later ruled out. Kleiner implicated Stosser, now 61 years old and living in Heightstown, in both Irene's case and the murder of Donna Macheo from East Windsor, who disappeared in 1984 and whose body was found in 1995. Kleiner's allegations made headlines in the New Jersey section of the Sunday New York Times. Kleiner also disputed the accuracy of the blood DNA evidence presented during Harvey's second trial, claiming it was flawed and contaminated. He called for additional DNA testing on other pieces of evidence, suggesting they could implicate Stoasser. Kleiner raised concerns about missing evidence, including the absence of hair from the quilt. He questioned the classification of the retrieved hair, noting that it was initially labeled as Caucasian and later had the phrase, and one Negroid hair added. He alleged that all the hair evidence, technicians' notes, and microfilm had mysteriously disappeared leading him to suspect that the hair evidence never existed. Capsack, continuing his role as a prosecutor in Middle Assault County, expressed unwavering confidence in Harvey's conviction, firmly asserting that Stowasser had no involvement in the crime. According to Capsack, Stowasser was initially considered a potential suspect, but was ultimately ruled out as a prime suspect. A pivotal piece of evidence in this case was the discovery of a blood-stained size 6 sneaker print on the victim's pillow, contradicting Stowasser's size 12 foot. Curiously, the report neglects to mention that Harvey himself wore size 6 sneakers. Still, Harvey insists that Stowasser's involvement was purely coincidental and not indicative of his culpability. In April 2007, Judge John F. Malone from the Superior Court dismissed Harvey's request for a new evidentiary hearing and rejected his habeas corpus challenge, thus shattering Harvey's hopes. He reversed Harvey's 1994 conviction, initially a death penalty, due to deficient legal aid during the early 1990s. Despite this turn of events, Harvey, aged 65, was still sentenced to serve 70 years for a separate charge. His 1994 death sentence had been commuted to life imprisonment without parole when New Jersey abolished the death penalty in 2007. Prior to this, Harvey had spent two decades on death row, although the state had not executed anyone since 1963. However, Harvey's life ended in November 2020 in the State Woods State Prison, effectively ending any further investigation. Peter Stolwasser emerged as a suspect in Donna Mashaw's murder. Mashaw's remains were discovered in 1995, roughly a mile from the Irene crime scene. Both Mashaw and Stolwasser were said to be students at Mercer County College in the fall of 1983. After Mashaw's disappearance, Stolwasser failed to attend the spring session classes he had registered for. Stolwasser, however, maintains that although he was a student at Mercer County College, he had no connection to Mashaw. Harvey was also linked to Donna Mashaw, as her remains were found near a farm where Harvey had been briefly employed, raising suspicions. Her abandoned car was found near a sewer plant, conveniently located within a short walk from Harvey's home. Adding to the intrigue, 
These peculiar circumstances led authorities to scrutinize Harvey and consider his possible involvement in the case. Finally, in the last week of April 2023, New Jersey Attorney General Matthew J. Platkin announced the conclusive identification of the person responsible for the assault and murder of Donna Michelle. The Attorney General stated that the case was solved when investigators revisited this age-old mystery. Colonel Patrick Callahan, superintendent of the New Jersey State Police, noted that even after four decades, the cruelly extinguished young life still haunts the hearts of those who loved her. The culprit callously left her remains in a shallow grave, undisturbed for over a decade. However, the pursuit for justice never dies. Even though the perpetrator died in prison in 2020, serving time for another horrific crime, it does not lessen the importance of this long-awaited resolution. We applaud the unyielding efforts of the Central Regional Cold Case Task Force and the committed state police forensic scientists. Their dedication and persistence serve as a reminder that justice's pursuit knows no bounds. We invite you to share your thoughts on this case in the comments section below. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to our channel for more riveting true crime stories. Until then, stay safe and keep an eye out for the next mystery to unravel.